the Sackler Colloquia on the Science of Science Communication, where scientists and communication professionals come together to write a better future for communicating science. Welcome back, everyone, to the last portion of day two of the Sackler Colloquium, the Science of Science Communication 2 hosted by the National Academy of Sciences. I want to take a brief moment to welcome our third panel of the day today. And they're going to be addressing the challenge of creating coherent narratives for science. I mean, we all know how dramatically stories affect us and how important storytelling is for getting a message across. And our speakers are going to talk about research into the nature of narratives, how they develop, how they're translated through audiences by mass media, and we'll also learn how scientists talk to each other, how they deal with controversy and uncertainty, and how that can be translated into narrative form, and lastly, how narratives can play a role in social movements. So we're going to begin with our first speaker, Michael Dahlstrom. He's a professor of journalism at Iowa State University, and he's going to be discussing how narratives work in media and mass communication. Following that, we'll hear from Kevin Dunbar, who's a professor of human development and quantitative methodology at the University of Maryland. He's going to talk about how scientists talk to one another and what the public hears when they do so. And third, we're going to hear from Julie Downs. She's a professor in the Department of Social and Decision Sciences at Carnegie Mellon University. And she's going to be talking about how interactive media communication can improve teen health. In between each of these talks, we're going to hear a conversation by our two discussants. Melanie Green is a professor of psychology at the University of North Carolina. And Marty Kaplan is a professor in the University of Southern California's Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism. Just as before, they're going to have just a few minutes for a brief conversation immediately following each speaker's talk. And at the very end of all three talks and discussions, we will open it up to you guys at home and those of you who are live in the audience to have uh, an integrated conversation. So please welcome Michael Dahlstrom. All right, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for the other presenters who have given nods to narratives and stories throughout much of uh, yesterday and today. So I'm going to be talking about science narratives. And the first thing I want to get out right on the table, right off at the beginning, is that storytelling does not have the best of reputations within science. Um, I actually heard, overheard this twice during break yesterday. So I know it's out there in the audience. Um, so scientists sometimes think of stories as baseless, even manipulative, or something on which we should not base our interpretations. And I think that's good. I think that's good. I think that's a solid sentiment within data collection. But the argument I'm going to make today is in the context of communicating science to non-experts, narratives can be appropriate and meaningful communication tools. However, and it gets its own bullet point, Narratives also raise ethical considerations about when to use them and how to use them to communicate science. So this is the outline of what I'm going to cover. First, I'm going to do a broad overview of narratives and narrative research, and then we'll get into the ethical considerations. OK, so first of all, what is narrative? It is a format of communication using a causally linked temporal sequence of events involving specific human-like characters. <laughs> you might also call it telling a story. One good thing about working with narrative is people seem to have an intuitive sense of what a narrative is. When we mention storytelling, anecdotes, testimonials, we know what we're talking about. OK, one thing I want to cover is how they're processed. Um, there's claims that there are two cognitive processes, the way that we interpret narrative. So we have the paradigmatic pathway, which controls the encoding of evidence-based arguments, and narratives are processed completely differently. So we have a narrative pathway which controls the encoding of situation-based exemplars. OK, let's compare these two a little bit. So evidence-based versus narrative communication. Evidence-based communication is context-free. It's created of facts. And you can rip facts out of the message. And they still maintain their meaning. And I can bring them over here and shove them in another message. And they still have the same meaning. 
In contrast, narratives derive their meaning from the context in which they are situated. So I can't rip out a section of a narrative and hold it up because it's lost its meaning, and I've also ruined the narrative that I ripped it out of. So direction of generalization is another way that narrative and evidence-based communication differs. So evidence-based communication begins with these general truths, with these abstractions, from which you can distill down what does that mean in a specific situation. Narratives flip that completely. So narratives give you a specific. They give you, here is an example from which I can generalize up to figure out what are those abstract truths that must be in effect if this situation is happening. So two paths. They are not created equally. There's claims that narratives are the default human mode of thought. So it's narratives are the way that we make sense of the world, the way we understand cause and effect, the way we understand why people act the way they do. And I think there's also some intuitive sense to this. So when I come home uh, from work, my wife says, how was your day? I might say, oh, let me tell you a story. All right, here's what happened. Very rarely will I say, well, you know, in general, an uh, individual who experienced the events that I did today would, on average, react <laughs> thusly. OK, another one I think is very powerful. Narratives have been found to be recalled twice as well and read twice as fast as evidence-based content. So think about that a second. If I have one group over here, I give them a narrative. This group over here, I give logic, evidence-based arguments about the same idea. This group is done and out the door before they're even halfway done, and they remember more. I think that's quite powerful just in the format of communication. Sometimes people think, well, you know, we need to teach more evidence-based communication, more logical reasoning. And I think that's good, but I also don't want to assume that narratives are a disadvantage, that it's, it's a subpar way of thinking. So there's uh, some claims that actually narratives have given us as humans an evolutionary advantage as working in, in large social groups. Narratives let me figure out what this other human is thinking and what they might do to me, and it, it helps me do cause and effect so I can predict what's going to happen over here. And in fact, there's some, actually two scholars that have said it's one thing that separates us from humans, and so we are actually homo narrans. We narrate. What does this mean for science? Well, let's get a nice example. The vaccine controversy. I think this is a good example where you have evidence-based safety. You have this evidence, which is we have done many studies. There is no evidence linking vaccines and autism. Compared to a narrative of harm. Well, I heard about Sam, and he got a vaccine. He got autism a month later. OK, we have these two ones in contrast. And I like this quote. The deputy director of the National Immunization Program stated, this is like nothing I've ever seen before. It's an era where it appears that science isn't enough. And I think in this case, rather than a diminishing faith in science, likely part of it is because of this processing conflict. We have one group talking evidence-based, and we have another group talking narrative comprehension. Why do narratives matter? This is all fine and good. This is interesting. But one claim I want to make is that narratives matter a lot for science communication because non-experts get most of their science information from the media. So it makes sense to get narratives into the news because it can fulfill some of these. Now, a lot of times we think of science communication. We think of news. We think of informative content. Let's not forget entertainment media. Entertainment media routinely uses narrative formats, and if you think about the amount of content that is consumed, entertainment media is more ubiquitous. I may sit down and watch a half-hour evening news, and then I stay in the same spot and watch three hours of television. So we have cultivation theory in particular looks at how the patterns within storytelling impacts what we think about the real world. So don't forget entertainment media, which is also biased toward narrative formats, also has a large impact in what we do. And I'm glad we've already talked about Breaking Bad and the chemistry, so we can move on. OK. Now we start to get a little sticky here, because narratives are intrinsically persuasive. Narratives imply a normative assessment, yet they neither state nor defend their assumptions. So you see a narrative, you see someone who's good, someone who's bad, or you, there's morals in there that say, if I do this, I will achieve this. And we see that normative assessment, but there's no justification, or there doesn't have to be. Narratives reduce the formation of counterarguments through transportation. So the more that I'm transported into a narrative, the more I am so engaged in that narrative, I don't have the cognitive resources remaining 
to develop counterarguments based on what I'm seeing. So the more I am engaged, the more likely I am to just accept what the narrative is telling me. Now, of course, after the fact, I can then spend more cognitive energy and go against it, but that takes more time, and a lot of times the next show comes on, so I don't have time. Fictional narratives result in similar levels of persuasion. I know Breaking Bad is not true. I, I know that's not what happens, but I learn chemistry, right? So there's evidence that fiction versus fact, there's still similar levels of narrative persuasion. And so what this means is narratives can be used strategically to persuade otherwise resistant audiences about certain beliefs. And so we have here at NAS the Science and Entertainment Exchange, which we've already heard a little bit about, that works with producers um, to ensure that the portrayals of science within Hollywood television are as accurate as possible. Okay. <laughs> so knowing that narratives are intrinsically persuasive and can be manipulative, what are the ethics of using narrative to communicate science? And we're going to jump right into the firestorm. We're not messing with the easy ones. Let's go into where we have these politically charged science issues, climate change, nanotech, genetically modified organisms. What are the ethical considerations that a science communicator should think about when they are considering, should I use a narrative in this context? I'm going to give you three to think about. The first one is the underlying purpose for using narrative improved comprehension or improved persuasion. So basically, you need to think, what is the appropriate role of science communication within this social controversy? Is it to persuade an audience to accept views about science? I want to take wherever the audience is with their beliefs and pull them to this point. Or do I want to clarify understanding and engage a wider public in a more vigorous debate? I want you to understand this so you can go over there and keep fighting, but fight more intelligently. They're completely different goals. And so you need to decide which is the one that's appropriate for your context because a narrative can be used for both. If I want to persuade you, I can choose events that explain the preferred side of a science issue. I can portray that through characters that either agree with the preferred side or learns to do so throughout the narrative, or I can, and I can conceal or undermine the values underlying the opposing side. In contrast, a narrative that increases comprehension, I can choose events that explain all the sides around the science issue. I can portray through a character that's neutral to the issue or through multiple characters that have multiple sides. And I can emphasize and bring out the underlying social values that intersect with an issue. So narratives can use, be used for both sides. The ethical question is what role should I play in this controversy? Number two, what are the appropriate levels of accuracy to maintain? So implicit in all of this is that the science should remain accurate, right? We're not talking about lying. I mean, that's another conference. Um, so, the problem with narratives is there's multiple levels of accuracy, and not all of them need to remain accurate. You choose one that you want to highlight, and you might be able to let the other one slide for the larger purposes of communication. So two I'm going to touch on real quickly, external realism and representativeness. External realism, what aspects within the narrative need to stay accurate relative to the real world? So we'll jump down to the bottom. There's lots of elements within a narrative. Characters, motivations, actions, settings, situations, events, procedures, time frames, et cetera. Which of those are, do you want to use to communicate the science? That should remain externally relevant, but maybe the rest you can change. So for instance, our picture here, making bubbles. What if you want to talk about the process of converting corn into ethanol? Well, if I have a little happy face here on the yeast, and I say this yeast is very hungry, and he likes to eat sugar, and he poops out energy, carbon dioxide, and alcohol, but he's picky, he's going to wait until it's the right temperature. The procedure can be very externally real. That's what I'm trying to communicate. The fact that there's a face on yeast is very inaccurate. <laughs> but, but I can use that to increase the comprehension. This happens in science all the time. If you think back to physics class, how much force will it take you to push this cube across a frictionless surface? There's no such thing as a frictionless surface. But we can let that accuracy slide so we can focus on something else, and that's what's happening here. Okay, representativeness. Remember, audience will generalize from a narrative example out, so should the example that you choose be representative? So going back to the vaccine example, if you say, yes, you know, I, I hear the narrative 
um, this person got a, a vaccine and got autism. I'm going to counter that by saying, see this girl? She did not get a vaccine and she got polio. Okay? There's a narrative. But is that an appropriate narrative to use? Because it's not representative of what would happen. If I chose not to get a vaccine, would I get polio? Probably not. It's the chances there. So if my goal is to increase understanding, this probably would not be an appropriate narrative to use. If my goal was persuasion, of course, that's exactly where I would want to be. So it comes back to what is the goal of communication. Should narrative be used at all? Using narrative, if scientists use narrative, it may violate expectations of how people think scientists should communicate. It might be, I mean, we don't know. I have not seen empirical evidence on this, but it's possible that in the mind of the audience, science is so linked with evidence-based communication that as soon as a scientist breaks that expectation and moves away, are they ruining that violation and, of course, then losing credibility? Don't know. It's an empirical question. Yet... Other stakeholders will likely be using narrative within the debate, and so it may be unethical not to use narrative and surrender the benefits of a communication technique to the non-expert side of a science topic. Okay, I have a little bit of time left. Thinking of storytelling within science communication is fairly recent, and so I want to throw out three examples of where I think existing conversations in science communication could benefit from looking at narrative. Do narratives help or hinder the desire to build trust between science and non-experts? We've heard a lot about trust, about increasing warmth. Again, we don't know. Will a narrative format of communication build trust because it's something more understandable? Um, the audience will be uh, appreciative that the science is, tried, is, is packaged in a way that's easy to understand. Or will it be seen as manipulative? If the persuasive intent comes out, oh, I see what you're doing. You're trying to trick me with the narrative. <coughs> now I'm wrecked. We don't know. How can narratives meet the science communication needs of new media audiences? We just had the previous panel that talked about sharing and, and what, are the, what are the messages that get transferred. I think narratives meet a lot of those expectations. There's a lot of emotion tied with narrative. There are units that uh, I'm going to tell you a story, I'll pass that on. In the new media environment, will narratives be selected more often from a more active audience? Will, the, will they be shared more often? Interesting. Can narratives help communicate science beyond human scale? Now, what does that mean? Make sure you ask me in the Q&A, because I'm out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that great paper. You had a provocative uh, message toward the end the idea that it might be unethical not to use narrative. So I want to push that to be even more provocative. There, between the narrative pathway and the scientific or paradigmatic pathway, there is an ongoing experiment being conducted, and 90% of Americans have been part of it without giving informed consent. And what I'm referring to is direct-to-consumer drug marketing. You may have uh, seen many of these. You probably have. Typically, they are two things at the same time. There is a story. You see people, you hear music, and it's someone who starts sad and ends up happy. And they involve things like depression, insomnia, restless leg syndrome, and so on. At the same time, there is the FDA-required side effects, which are mentioned at great length, sometimes as long as a minute, by the narrator, including nausea, dizziness, suicidal ideation, uh, sleep driving, and compulsive gambling, my favorite. <laughs> the industry has placed a $5 billion bet that that is effective. Is it really effective? Well, I call, uh, as a witness, the great social scientist Plato, who said that story, poetry, has an independent access to our cognitive apparatus. And so even if we don't want to be affected by story, even if we've been trained in logic and geometry, the passions of story will govern us. 
Uh, Dan Kahneman uh, in System 1 and System 2, I believe, is endorsing that. There are uh, political scientists like Brendan uh, Nyan and uh, other scholars like uh, Dan Kahan at Yale, whose research suggests that, in fact, we are suckers for narrative, whether we want to be or not. Scientific discourse goes out into the bazaar in which it does not have a privileged standing. It competes with other narratives, and those other narratives have billions and billions of dollars behind them, counter-narratives and alternative realities designed to be the antimatter to the scientific narrative. So the question is, is it, un is it unethical not to be involved? You know the expression, don't bring a knife to a gunfight. I submit, don't bring a data set to a food fight. <laughs> well, I can't argue with that um, argument to use narratives. And I'm going to add one other argument to the list. So should scientists use narratives? And those of you that were here yesterday heard Susan Fisk's fantastic talk on person perception and how we perceive people along two main axes. Are you warm? Are you likable? And are you competent? And it just so happens that we have some recent studies that we completed in our lab that looked at um, what kinds of evidence or communications people use and what implications that has for person perception. And although these studies weren't done in the context of science communication, I think it maps on fairly well. Because what we compared was, were people using statistical information or were they using narratives? And there's sort of a long-standing debate in the persuasion literature about which is better and which is more persuasive. And we looked at, hey, how does that affect how people are perceived? And as you might expect, what we found was that if people are using statistics, they're perceived as more competent, but if they're using narratives, they're perceived as more warm. Okay, not necessarily mutually exclusive, but one thing that adding narratives to our science communication can do is sort of up our standing on that warmth dimension. And that goes along with some other research that suggests that narratives can increase empathy for outgroups. So to the extent that in certain political climates, scientists are perceived as outgroups or other or strange, if we're using those narratives, it might encourage that empathy and perspective taking that will lead to greater openness to the kinds of scientific messages that people are communicating. Um, second thing that I wanted to mention about Michael's excellent talk is that it kind of casts out the question, hey, should we use narrative? But there's a range of different kinds of narratives. If you think about scientific research being looking at patterns of cause and effect, well, that's exactly what stories do. They show sequence of events. They go from one place to another. And in fact, in my own field, psychology, we're often given the advice that when you're writing your journal article, make it a good story. And so that same kind of finding the story of your data can be useful in communicating your science to a broader audience as well. And then finally, I want to springboard on a point that Marty made about the kind of environment that these narratives are entering into, this competitive environment. And one thing that I want to highlight is that although we're talking about these communications or these narratives, those narratives go out into a social, conf uh, a social context. And so we're not just talking about persuading an individual person with a narrative, but if that person buys our science or our narrative, what, is, what does their social group think? So if I start believing something different, is somebody on Facebook going to unfriend me? Are the people from my church group going to stop talking to me? And so how we get these conflicting narratives to maybe talk across those lines and, and speak to each other, I think is a broader question about how these narratives are embedded in a broader social context. All right, next up we have Kevin Dunbar. What I'm going to do today is talk about two lines of research. One of them is where I spent a year in four molecular biology labs looking at what scientists do. So we videotaped, we audio taped the scientists and discovered things about the way scientists communicate, how they communicate, uh, what they do in general. And I'm going to interleave that where we took the findings from what the scientists do, and we actually investigated these findings uh, in people in my lab, 
and also brain scanning technologies to see which parts of the brain are involved in what the scientists do and what effect does this have on the scientists. And then we'll talk about how scientists interact with uh, other scientists and other media. Okay, so what we've been ta talking about today is the, um, there's been a lot of talk about new media like Twitter. And uh, one uh, diagram that came out recently uh, from Carnegie Mellon University uh, depicts the different uh, types of channels that scientists use. So that there was the early modern era where uh, people used meetings and journals and um, letters, whereas today we have these other things like social networks, Twitter, and the interesting thing is that even today, these social networks are not really used to disseminate or distribute scientific discovery. These media are used after the discovery has been reported in the regular uh, paper or digital uh, format. And it could, there have been some attempts to change this, but the thing is that science is really a product of human beings. And what we want to do today is explore, uh, is the medium the message? So how do scientists actually communicate with each other? And the key thing here is that communication, science, the media, everything is, a, is built by human beings. It's built by human uh, brains. So we, it's aided by these technologies like uh, the internet or Twitter or blogs but they're aids to the way that the human brain works. And what happens is that what we're going to discover is that people use a set of strategies or heuristics to both conduct their science and communicate the science. And one thing that we did, for instance, is, so we looked at these lab meetings uh, from, uh, initially it was uh, four labs at a major US uh, university, and these labs had all made amazing discoveries, and we videotaped and audio taped the lab meetings. I also interviewed the people about what happens at the meetings and interviewed the scientists before and after the meetings. And then we went on to look at labs in Canada and also in Italy. And one further aspect of this is that some of these scientists were actually uh, doing science on the one hand, and doing um, work with patients on the other hand. So there were regular medical doctors seeing patients, and we compared the way they see their patients with the way they do their science. Is there a, different, is there a difference in the types of thought processes that the scientists use? So we can ask, well, what do they actually talk about at their meetings? So what we did is we looked at all the outcomes in, uh, this was 10 meetings. So they had 417 outcomes, and we can see whether the outcomes were consistent with our hypothesis or inconsistent with the hypothesis. And we find that the majority of the time is spent talking about data that's inconsistent with our hypothesis. Now you can immediately ask, uh, do they talk about this to the media, is this uh, go outside the lab? And uh, clearly that's not the story that the uh, scientists, uh, most scientists tell. And one strategy that they use is they use analogy. So analogy is a key thing that they use when they get their findings, is they compare the finding that they got, particularly if the finding is unexpected, with something that they previously uh, know. Now, one thing that's interesting here is they tend to use what I've called uh, three different types of analogies. One I call uh, regional analogies, which is how they generate hypotheses. So these are, if you're working in an HIV lab and your analogies for fixing experiments using other HIV experiments, don't work, then you'll switch your domain to something like bacteria. So they use analogy to help fix the problems that they have. So local analogies, which is HIV to HIV or HIV to MLV, 
It's used to fix small problems with how the experiments work, whereas regional analogies to uh, another related domain are um, frequently used to formulate hypotheses. Now, one thing that we see in the media a lot is scientists make these what we call long distance analogies. And they make analogies to radically different domains. And sometimes that will get confused as to whether that was causal. So the analogy that they used to explain something was actually the analogy that they used in doing their research. And what we found is that they weren't. They're used to explain things to other people. And the goal, goals dictate what you're going to do. So if the goal is to generate hypotheses, uh, you highlight the relations between items and between what you're working on now and some other biological organism, let's say. And what we want to know is, why does this happen? And what are the mechanisms by which people generate the uh, analogies? Can we harness this in science education? Uh, can this be a useful tool uh, for educating the media? And uh, talking about media, um, I uh, will show you in a, in a minute uh, an analogy that was recently used in the New York Times. But we've been using fMRI to scan people's brains. And what we find is that the amount of activation in particular regions of the brain uh, it gets turned up when you make an analogy. And given how important analogy is to science, what we uh, find here is that there's particular ways that they're related. So the semantic distance between, in the analogy, you have what's called the source. So let's say you're working on HIV. And uh, uh, so, sorry, the source would be if, if you're working on a bacterium and then you target HIV as, as the, what you're going to explain. So let's say you get a weird finding with HIV. You could analogize from another HIV experiment or from a bacteria. And what we find, so we've um, looked at the amount of activation that's in a particular area of the brain called the frontal polar cortex. And the amount of activation there is related to how far away the source is from the target. And the nice thing about this is we can use uh, computational tools to look at what the distance is, so we don't actually decide beforehand. And, but just to explain um, what a good analogy is, there was, uh, this one was uh, in the New York Times recently. And so it was about the new rules for um, la labeling uh, certain diseases. So the, the um, some uh, diseases have been thought to be cancer, and they've decided to not use the term cancer. And so in here, they're going to talk about uh, ductal carcinoma, which they're no longer calling a cancer because it might scare people. So it's been a huge policy change. So Dr. Norton, who was not part of the report, agreed that doctors do need to focus on better communication with patients about precancerous and cancerous conditions. He said he often tells patients that even though ductal carcinoma in situ may look like cancer, it will not necessarily act like cancer. Just as someone who is dressed like a criminal is not ex actually a criminal until that person breaks the law. And what's really interesting about this analogy is it has a nice mapping between the thief idea, people are familiar with the idea, and they can immediately draw the relations between them. So much of analogy happens automatically. You can pull out the relations here, which is why it's so important in politics as well as science. So we've looked at uh, the use of analogies, whoops, and uh, what we can then look at here is what did I make these analogies about? So in another study here, we scanned people's brains when they got data that was consistent with their hypothesis. So we gave them hypotheses, and then we gave them data. And we looked at the activation in, in the brain. So if you 
Um, if you look at the, the one on the right with the data that's inconsistent, so there's an area of the brain that basically says there's something weird out there. It's an error detection uh, mechanism. So when you get data that's inconsistent with your hypothesis, we only see activation there. Whereas if the data is consistent with your hy uh, hypothesis, you accept it and it, it gets processed into memory. So basically, if it's inconsistent with your hypothesis, then what you do is you gate it out. Now, one thing that we might say is, well, let's give them more examples. In this original study, we only gave them 20 examples of data. So we tried it with 100 examples instead. And what happened is they still uh, stuck with the, uh, the uh, hypothesis that had been uh, disproven. Now, the other thing that scientists engage in when they uh, talk with each other is that they have lab members. So there's a group, and it could be 30 people, it could be five people. And when they get data that they don't understand, the labs with everyone from the same background do not make a discovery. They don't use analogy properly. So analogical reasoning isn't, if everybody has the same background like E. coli, and they're all from E. coli backgrounds, the only analogies that they can make to explain their strange data are analogies to E. coli. Whereas if you have labs with people from different backgrounds, like some of them might be physicists, some of them might be chemists, what they do in that situation is there's a lot of crosstalk between findings from different disciplines that actually helps them uh, use analogies that then helps them make a discovery. Now, the uh, one thing that has come up here is people have, have talked about changing people's minds about uh, things we can change versus uh, things that we can't change. So. Okay. so look at this. So did the first ball cause the second ball to move? You should all say yes. <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> that's, the, uh, that's the general answer. Um, whereas if you see this movie, did the first ball cause the second ball to move? OK, so somebody said yes. So the, so the general answer here, so we're going to see that it could be yes or it could be no, depending upon your interpretation. So what we did with this is we gave people the story that these are two balls. Or we uh, told them that, so we said, imagine that these two uh, circular objects are billiard balls. Uh, so we give them 20 instances of this. And they say that the first ball uh, caused the second ball to move only if it touches it. Whereas if we give them a situation where there's a gap between the two balls, what they do there is they say the first ball didn't cause the second ball to move. However, if you tell them that these are two positively charged subatomic uh, particles, what they will do is they will then uh, say that the first, the first, in the first situation where the ball hits each other, the first ball did not cause the second ball to move. Whereas in the subatomic particles condition, what happens there is that they will say that the first ball caused the second ball to move even, uh, even though they didn't touch. So the basic point here is that people did this very easily. But what did their brains do? So what their brains did is their brains treated this, both situations in exactly the same way. So, and they were able to do it, as you can see here, they were able to do it easily. So there's one last thing I want to talk about here, which are gender analyses of scientists. So what we've, uh, what we've done here is we compared the women scientists to men scientists, and there were no differences between the women and the men scientists in their social interactions, in their analogical reasoning, but in terms of unexpected findings, men were more likely to know what the cause was 
And whereas women were actually more likely to determine the cause of, of, what, of what happened. And so basically, um, and both strategies are actually good strategies because we can't predict what's going to happen in the world. And ignoring the unexpected finding might be good in some situations, whereas following it up might be ideal in other situations, and these situations vary. So that's what I'll, that's all I will say today. Thank you to Kevin Denbar. <laughs> all right, we'll open it up to our discussants. All right, well, um, I thought it was so exciting that those studies sort of turn the microscope in and look at what scientists themselves are doing. Um, and perhaps I wasn't the only one in uh, the beginning of the talk where the huge percentage of unexpected, uh, unexpected findings in these labs went, oh, okay, good, it's not just me. You know, we <laughs> all get these unexpected findings. Um, a couple of other things that I thought were really exciting about this talk, one is that I think it's a great argument for interdisciplinary, interdisciplinarity in science, to, for talking across those disciplinary boundaries. Um, but I think it also highlights this really exciting idea of the use of analogies, um, and if I can broaden that out to narratives. And obviously the talk showed how those were useful within the lab, but they're certainly very useful outside the lab too for bringing people in. And in particular, I want to highlight that narratives can be useful for, especially useful for particular types of audiences. So for example, you probably all know people who maybe when confronted with scientific findings sort of throw up their hands and go, oh, you know, I can't deal with math or physics is too hard, you know, maybe Barbie, those kinds of things. You don't have people who say, oh, I can't deal with stories, they're too hard. <laughs> and so, if you have people who have that sort of low self-efficacy for dealing with scientific information, not feeling like they can handle it, or people who are what social psychologists call low in need for cognition, people who aren't intrinsically motivated to just think about stuff all the time and solve problems, people who just want to think about things when it's relevant to them, those kind of people, you may be better able to get them in the door with these analogies. If you have an inviting narrative, it lowers those barriers. It makes that information seem more accessible to get people in. So I think that's where analogies can be important as well. Um, a couple other quick points about sort of the educational implications of this. So our department, my um, psychology department, um, strongly encourages all undergraduates to get actual experience in a research lab. And that has a lot of benefits, but one of the benefits that it has is that they learn that science is messy. It lear they learn that hypotheses aren't always confirmed. And where I think that's important is that when those people then go out into the world, and a lot of them aren't then going to be scientists, but they're going to be consumers of science, then they know that that's how the process works. It doesn't mean that things are wrong if the findings change with better information. That's just part of the process and it's okay, and so that might increase trust in these sorts of scientific findings. Um, another educational point, I want to take it up to a broader level. There's an initiative that's just getting started at UNC called Scientists with Stories, um, spearheaded by uh, one of our graduate students, Claire Fiesler, to train scientists in storytelling techniques. One of the challenges there is convincing scientists that it's worth their while to do this. And so if we can make a case that it will improve their science, to help them tell stories and help them communicate, that'll help sell that. If you can make better analogies by telling better stories, that helps your science as well as your dissemination. I'd like to draw a connection between uh, Michael's paper and, and Kevin's paper. Michael asked the question, should scientists use narrative? And I think by the evidence of Kevin's paper and all of your experience, they already do. Doing science is a narrative and story activity. Think of what happens when science is actually done. Uh, there are dead ends. There are surprises. There are mistakes. There is serendipity. There is adventure. There is the journey of collaboration, the journey of competition. There is ambition. There are characters involved who have personalities and motives. So uh, the choice of a problem to study, what is it that a scientific group is working on, that itself is a story that has to do with personalities and, and glory and money and all the other issues of drama. That is what happens when science is done. 
So what's scientific discourse is a narrative strategy. When you read a paper that is published in a peer-reviewed journal, something has happened to all of that. It is a kind of reverse engineering so that the ending becomes the thing that everything led to, <laughs> even though it wasn't in fact the case. There is a retroactive inevitability about the tale told by a scientist. The, uh, one of the uh, terms that I've heard used about the voice is first person invisible. Um, <laughs> there is a reliable, omniscient narrator of a scientific paper, something that Jane Austen or George Eliot would instantly recognize as the voice that is telling what is happening in a paper. So in fact, what a scientific publication is doing is that it is removing the science from the scientific publication. And the question is, why is that the case? Uh, Michael showed a slide in which, uh, looking forward, uh, there were two roads diverging in the wood. There was the paradigmatic pathway and the narrative pathway. I think the case I've been trying to make is that they are not two di different divergent roads. In fact, it is a highway with a couple of lanes and a dotted line, and the scientists are going back and forth in the course of their work, and then they are determinedly staying in the slow lane when they do the exposition of it. <laughs> Thank you to our discussants, and up next is Julie Downs. Thank you. Uh, is this the one? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about communicating science um, directly to an audience that's going to be able to make direct use of the scientific understanding that you're trying to convey. Um, specifically, I'm talking about um, people who are at risk for some kind of negative outcome, whether it's obesity-related illness, smoking-related illness, um, other kinds of, of high-risk behaviors. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit in general, and then I'm going to end with a case study um, where we tried to communicate the science of sex to adolescent girls. So you can wait for that part. Uh, you got to get through the first part first, though. Um, so, yeah, what if I, uh, what, I know this sounds wacky, but what if we communicated to people? What if we actually talked to people? And this does sound kind of crazy. Well, of course we should communicate to people. We want them to know something. But we often, we do a very bad job of it, or we really don't bother directly communicating to the people who we want to be using the science and really making that um, effort to reach out to these audiences and make sure that they, the ones who can use the science, um, get, this, get the information from us. Um, so I'm going to talk about, in, <laughs> I can skip over a lot of stuff because it's been covered very nicely, um, but how narrative communications um, really have a unique power to promote understanding, um, and then that understanding can help improve decision making. People can um, get a better outcome uh, for themselves. And so just to touch on uh, some benefits of narrative that have been uh, talked about a lot, um, narratives can really capture attention. Um, get people in so that they can watch your message. When you look at the kind of um, messaging, especially health messaging, um, that we tend to do, one of the ways that we tend to try to capture attention, it's a very popular way, is by using fear, by using a threat. And, you know, and that can work. So, you know, <laughs> you're not going to touch these wires now, right? And if that's not bad enough, there's also a $200 fine. So you're <laughs> definitely not going anywhere near those wires. But one of the problems is holding that attention. Once you scare them, then they're not going to listen to a single other word you say. So to, to keep them in so that they can get to actually the understanding of the science um, takes a little more effort. So if you read at the bottom, you'll see that the, uh, the bridge is out ahead. You know, by the time they've gotten there, everything is lost. Narrative really has a unique ability to pull people in and be almost self-reinforcing. Get that message across keep people with you, get all the way to the end of the message, because they want to know what comes next. They're learning something. They might not even really realize they're learning something. So you're giving them some coherent arguments that make sense. 
Um, visual imagery, vivid imagery that can help with better recall. It's another point that's come up a, a number of times today and yesterday. Um, and a foundation for new knowledge. You're going to teach them something, but then they're going to go out into the world and there's going to be uh, new information that they come across in their daily lives. And there's going to be new scientific advances. And you're going to want people to have a firm understanding of the underlying science so that when they come across this new information, they can use it and incorporate it um, and, and understand it on their own without having constantly to be re-educated as things go forward. <laughs> so in terms of translating the science into the narratives, um, it's been shown to be useful to have some kind of theoretical model as a guide. And in my field, where I do a lot of, of um, understanding about health decisions, um, social cognition models of health have been shown um, to be useful for creating, uh, creating communications. And these are models like um, the health belief model, um, theory of reasoned action. There's a number of, a number of different models. Um, and in fact, research has shown that communications that rely on a theoretical model typically do better than communications that have no theoretical underpinning. Um, but which model you choose, which theory you choose, doesn't seem to matter. And so what that sort of suggests is that the theory itself may not be critical, it may not be indispensable, but that the use of a theory, it's sort of prompting people to think more broadly, to think beyond that one piece of like, we're just going to scare the pants off and that's going to do the trick. Like, no, we better, we better actually cover a couple more topics um, and sort of get that kind of thing. But one of the things that none of these general theories can do by their very design is figure out what you have to tell people. If you're going to communicate to somebody the science of smoking risk or the science of, of um, you know, any kind of a thing that they're trying to understand, you need to get into some domain-specific um, account of what that science is. Um, and so for that, you need some kind of domain-specific assessment to figure out what you need to communicate, what needs to go into that narrative. Um, and I'm going to talk just a little bit about once you've developed a narrative, um, one way that we um, generate this, and, and I'll, I'll get to some examples, um, is to have a sort of comparison between what people need to know and, and what they already know, so you know what to target, and I'll, and I'll go through that in some detail. But once you have this narrative, how do you know it's going to work? There's about a million different ways you can create a narrative, um, and some are better than others, and probably the first one you communicate, even if you do a very good job, even if you work with very good experts in communication, is not going to be the best possible communication. You want to make it the best communication that you can possibly create. And so in order to do that, you really need to bring science in, again, on your side, the science of communication, and, and understand how people are interpreting this narrative. Um, and so one of the ways we do this is through just iterative testing of early versions of the narrative with members of whatever the target audience is that you're trying to reach to make sure, um, are they understanding this the way you think they should understand it? Are the word choices that you've used things that people are intuitively interpreting in a way that's consistent with the way you think um, that they should be interpreting it? And to the extent that you're offering any kind of advice, um, how practical is that advice? It's, it's great to offer somebody advice on what they should do, but if they get that advice, they say, well, I can't do that. Um, then you may as well have not offered them any advice. And so this kind of iterative testing uh, where what we do is we just pilot test things with the audience um, in a way that we encourage criticism. You know, you want to be able to make sure that people are willing to tell you that your narrative stinks. Um, one way to do that is to have somebody else ask them and say, this thing kind of stinks, can you help us make it better? And they're happy to, happy to do that and tell you that what you've done is terrible. Um, and you take their input and you refine what you've done and then you go out and test it again and you just do this over and over until you have something that when you give it to the people, you know, representatives of the audience you want to eventually go to, they see it, they understand it exactly the way you want them to understand it. If there's advice, they say, that's how I'm going to do that next time I'm in that situation. That's perfect. And you have something that you know is going to be relatable, you know it makes sense, you know it's explaining the science um, in a way that's, that's going to make sense. So I'm just going to touch on a project where we use narrative um, to target sexual decisions for uh, adolescent girls to help them avoid unwanted pregnancy and um, sexually transmitted infections. Um, and what we had, the way we delivered this narrative was using interactive video. Um, An interactive video can be a pretty good uh, vehicle for delivering narrative, especially when you're talking about audiences that uh, maybe aren't very high in need for cognition, maybe are skeptical, maybe um, don't have a whole lot of patience with you, and adolescents kind of fit that bill um, <laughs> fairly well. Um, but a video can sort of pull them in, and the interactivity in the video can help pull them in 
Adolescents are really used to sort of nonlinear uh, media consumption. They play games online. Um, they consume YouTube videos, streaming from one to the next. They're used to having choice, and they're used to things going in a nonlinear path. And so one of the things that we could do with this interactive video was to give them that same feeling of agency, that same feeling of finding their way through the path. But in fact, underneath it all, we have a little structure so that we always bring them back to the parts that we really need them to get. Um, and so this sort of vehicle for getting a narrative across, um, we hoped would be um, um, pretty effective. And, and this is just a note to say that if there's time at the end, I'm going to show you a movie trailer of our video or part of it, whatever I have time to show. So let me just talk a little bit about um, how we developed this particular narrative. We started um, taking a normative approach of, of modeling the, the expert input. What do experts think adolescent girls need to know in order to make good decisions about sexual behavior? Um, and just as a side note here, there's been a lot of just talk about persuasion versus helping people understand. And here we're really taking a non-persuasive approach. Um, we're not t telling, and a lot of sexual education that adolescents get, let's just say it's an understatement to say that there's a persuasive um, element to it. Um, but we think that we and adolescents can all agree that we don't want them to get sexually transmitted infections, and they do not want to get sexually transmitted infections. We are all on the same page. And so we're not telling them what to do. We're giving them tools to understand how infections are transmitted, how different uh, um, uh, behavioral techniques and other kind of techniques can help to reduce the chance of infections. And so we started with this normative model where we took medical input, um, social science input, um, physiological um, science and understanding to put it all together into what someone would need to know. And then we did, um, a, took a descriptive step where we found out what do adolescents really need to know. And um, this was fairly intensive. Um, and I'm not going to go into details of how we did it in the interest of time, but I'm just going to touch on a couple of our key findings so that I can talk about how we translated those key findings into the narrative. So one finding was that um, adolescent girls seem to be really overwhelmed by um, what appears to be highly scripted behavior. And for those of you who aren't psychologists, and you might not have heard that term before, scripted behavior just means some kind of um, behavioral scenario that plays out the exact same way every time we're so accustomed to it that we don't even notice, and in fact, it would be jarring perhaps if things went differently. Sort of the canonical example of scripted behavior is that you go into a restaurant, you sit down, you get a menu, you order your food, your food comes, you eat it, you pay the bill, you walk out the door, and nobody really thinks halfway through, that was weird, why did we, you know, everybody knows how it goes. And when we talk to adolescent girls about sex, they may as well have been talking about going to a restaurant. You, you go to the party, you go upstairs, you, there's a line, you go in, et cetera. I won't bore you too many details. <laughs> <coughs> um, and, and that's how they talked about it. And it was really overwhelming. And that's something that we really didn't um, anticipate. Um, but but we, we went at this many, many ways. And, and we got this, this finding very, very strongly. They do not see themselves as having a lot of agency. Um, another thing we found was a general underappreciation of relative risk. So they're talking about the risk of sex. And, and I think this is something that's really reinforced by the kind of educational practices, the kind of um, experiences they've been having in all their sex ed classes, where there's a pretty explicit message that there's no such thing as safe sex. Things are, things are risky, um, and, and you want to be safe. And the only thing, of course, that's safe is, is abstinence. Um, which is another discussion that I won't get into. Um, but um, wh one of the things that we ask girls about risk, um, and they'll talk about behaviors and being risky or being safe, but then sometimes they'll end up tying themselves up in these logical knots about something that's just sort of on the verge, something that's just on that threshold. And so they'll talk about um, French kissing, um, which, well, it seems like it should be safe, but you could imagine a context in which somebody just had dental work and there was bleeding, you know, there's some sort of story they can tell. And then they, they don't know what to do with it and they just get stuck. Is it risky safe? Is it risky safe? I don't know. And so they don't have an answer. Um, and it sort of relates to the fact that they don't have this uh, uh, understanding, well, that, you know, maybe the risk is just low. Um, and that's just missing from their, from their understanding. Um, and we just found this widespread lack of health knowledge. They typically know a lot about HIV, and then when you ask them about everything else, they just slap HIV on top of it. They think all infections are bloodborne. Um, they don't understand about skin-to-skin -skin transmission. Um, they don't understand about why antibiotics might work for some things and not for other things. Um, and so just a, a general sort of lack of, of um, knowledge. Um, so I'm just going to go through briefly how we addressed each of these findings, um, and then I think I'm going to have time to show you the, the trailer. Um, if I'm quick. So um, the first thing with this, um, with this highly scripted behavior, um, we decided to really use this, to use this to our benefit in the narrative 
um, to make them feel very comfortable with this is what's going on. And so we really used these narratives that came out over and over and over again about how girls end up having sex um, because it's incredibly um, predictable. Um, and so we have characters in our narrative and they enter into this, um, into this highly scripted um, path and they're going along and things are just like they always go. And then it stops and we sort of hit them over the head and we explain that we're gonna do it in advance. There's nothing subtle about this at all. We hit them over the head and say, um, well, what should, the, what should this character do next? Um, what, what are her options? And so one option is to continue along the scripted path. But here's a couple of other options, and they're things that will sort of get her off of this scripted path. And we do this in a way that these are sort of suggestions for the ways that you might handle it. We have some that are sort of maybe cheeky and funny, and some that are just direct and no, and some that are evasive, so that the viewer can sort of find something that they feel comfortable with and, and, and learn about how to get off the scripted path if they want to do that. Um, and then we follow that up with a cognitive rehearsal um, that just kind of plays out on the screen for 30 seconds where we ask them to think about it and apply it to their own lives. And we can't force them to think, <laughs> if only we could, but we can at least force them to wait. And so during this 30 seconds, we hope that they give us some thought and apply it to their own lives. Um, for underappreciation of relative risk, we um, focused on this metaphor of a scale of risk going up, risk going down. Um, some behaviors are, or this is a mitigation strategy, some behaviors are <laughs> riskier than others and you can bring the risk back down um, by using different kind of, and I won't have to tell you what all these letters stand for, uh, but I'll let you guess. Um, for lack of health knowledge, we did a number of things. This is just a little demo of explaining to girls what their reproductive physiology looks like, where are things. Um, but we also talked, so we hit some of the misconceptions directly, so kids not understanding about skin-to-skin -skin contact uh, being one way that, that some kind of um, infections are transmitted. Um, that's actually a big misconception that leads to um, um, girls not maybe taking, using protection because they don't think they need to in some kind of situations. Um, it's hard to, to give this talk without being a little too explicit. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so we're, we're explicit in the video though, quite. Um, and so we sort of describe a little bit of the science and then we have a character address it um, and say, that's not true. And then that misconception can be, um, can be addressed. All right, I barely have time. Oh, we did an evaluation. It seems to work. We're doing another big evaluation. <laughs> Evaluations are important, but let's get to the movie. Can you hit play back there? I might have stopped it by accident, thanks. <coughs> I'll put that down. Is it not playing? Looks like the internet is not cooperating with your video. <laughs> oh, well, I can tell you about the evaluation. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be kind of a disappointment, but so we did an evaluation of an early version of this. <laughs> This is such a terrible note to end on. Uh, we found some really good outcomes. But right now, we're in the middle of a, a wide-scale field trial um, where we're going to have long-term follow-ups, health records, more clinical outcomes than we did in our pilot evaluation. Um, that's ongoing now. Uh, yeah, we're out of time. Um, so just in conclusion, it, it, interactive video can be a really good way of delivering narrative, especially if you're talking about audiences that are not that keen to listen to you, um, not that keen to learn maybe, but if you put the science in the right format, you can, you can get them. Thank you so much, Julie Downs. And now I will invite our discussants to, well, discuss. So it turns out actually that leaving people in suspense is a really good way of increasing engagement and interest. So uh, we inadvertently got to see a little bit of that here. Um, so I think this is, is such an exciting study and um, a lot of neat potential here. One thing that I really want to highlight that I thought was so wonderful about this was um, Julie's emphasis on the use of that formative research of figuring out really where people were, what kind of information they needed, what was going to be most helpful. I mean, that's a very key step to any of these kinds of um, interventions, so it was wonderful to see that emphasized. 
Um, although with that said, I'm going to take a, a couple minutes to play just a little bit of a devil's advocate here um, with regard to using these kinds of interactive videos. Um, and to do that, I'll sort of take a step back. And in the early days of virtual reality research, so where they were developing these helmets that you put on and you felt like you were in this world and you know nobody wants to walk across the rope over the bridge even though you're standing on the floor. Um, a lot of effort and time and technology goes into creating those virtual environments, but what, what they ran into was something that they called the book problem. And that's the problem that even with all of that input, we can still get largely the same experience by sitting down and looking at words on a page. Okay, um, these very low-tech ways of conveying stories can also be very effective. And in fact, I think we saw an example of that earlier this afternoon. Um, I think I'm in agreement with, with most of us when um, uh, Jenny was st uh, sharing her story of her cancer diagnosis. I mean, you could have heard a pin drop in here. I think we were all kind of um, very much engaged with her story that was just her words coming out. Um, and so I think it uh, behooves us as communicators to really be careful and think about times when are these technologies, when is this interactivity going to be helpful to us, and when is it going to be better to stick to these more low-tech options. And one way of kind of making those decisions is number one, thinking about your audience, but then also second, thinking about what kinds of psychological processes you're hoping to evoke with your message. So one thing that makes stories pers uh, persuasive, as Michael mentioned in his talk, is this idea that we get transported into them. We're immersed, we're carried along with the storyline, we're identifying with characters, um, and that's a pretty powerful experience. But if you're stopping people in the middle to make choices, oh, do I say this, do I say that? Do I make that choice or do I make that choice? That takes them out of the narrative. And are the benefits of kind of making them think about things or taking responsibility, is it worth that potential disruption to the narrative experience? Um, similar kind of thing, one of the ways that narratives can be persuasive is that they're sort of not threatening. You're taking people out of themselves, they're watching someone else. Whereas in, with an interactive narrative, it's more putting yourself into it. And maybe that's a good thing for persuasion, maybe it's a bad thing, um, depends on your context. So just sort of a, a word of caution to not necessarily leap into the, the biggest technology, but to match that to your message. The trailer that we saw, the video Julie talked about, is an example of something called entertainment education. It's an actual field that's been around for about 50 years. People are sometimes surprised to hear that something like that exists, but in fact it has a highly developed theoretical base, it has best practices, uh, it has impact evaluation, uh, and it's well known all over the world uh, for the efforts it has made in areas like uh, combating adult illiteracy or domestic violence and public health issues. The uh, Centers for Disease Control recognize the, the fact that people pay attention to health messages in entertainment, even if they know the entertainment is fiction. They think that what they are hearing about public health is true and useful. And because of that, the CDC in 2001 decided that they needed to have a presence in Hollywood. They had a competition, My Center won, and since then something called Hollywood Health and Society has been in effect the CDC's Hollywood office. It has subsequently been joined by half a dozen other funders in the area of climate change. Uh, what we do is work with pretty much all of, of the cable networks, all of the broadcast networks, many, many shows on primetime, hundreds of them. We take inquiries from shows. We reach out to them to inspire them in particular areas of national need in public health, and we study their impact. Uh, a few anecdotes from that world. Uh, if you know the show ER, we brokered a connection between Atul Gawanda, whose checklist was about to come out, and ER, so that in the finale, Noah Wiley's life was saved because the doctor was forced to use the checklist. And the day after that aired, in New York, there was a conference of 150 surgeons, and they decided that those surgeons should see the entire episode of ER as the best way to train them uh, on the checklist. Uh, Law & Order SVU did an episode about obesity and diabetes, and our impact analysis showed 
that African Americans identified most strongly with the African American main character and had an increased intention to diet and exercise. Um, the Bold and the Beautiful, 500 million people watch that show around the globe every day. We were involved in a storyline in which Tony, one of the main characters, confessed to his fiance that he was HIV positive. The day that happened, the STD HIV uh, helpline spiked from 2,000 calls to 5,000 calls, the most calls they got in a single year, exceeding every other public uh, service uh, announcement campaign and Surgeon General's effort. The Science and Entertainment Exchange does an amazing job in this same area. I'm honored to be on its board. So first, I want to thank Marty for his shout out to edutainment. That is also my field, and so I appreciate that. And now I want to open up to our final discussion of the day, both to the audience in-house and also to those of you who are participating remotely. And remember, send your questions to sacklerwebcast at nas.edu and also use the hashtag Sackler on Twitter. OK, so let's go ahead and start with a question that we got from the web. Let's see. What is the state of the theory of generalization by induction or abduction from narratives, case studies, or scenarios? I'll take that to our panel. And also, can you translate that question for us? That would be helpful. And let's all turn on our mics on the panel, in case if you've forgotten. The uh, philosophers have uh, always argued about is science inductive or is it deductive? And induction is basically you see a bunch of examples and then you generalize and form a theory. So one thing would be if all the swans you see are white, therefore swans are white. But if you go to Australia, you'll find black swans. So the generalization doesn't apply. So you try and come up with rules to understand. And there's been a huge amount of research over the past uh, 50 years on when scientists will generalize, when people will generalize. And um, so basically, it argues that people use both induction and deduction, and narratives can really be used to reinforce that. And, but I think you guys would know more about mar narratives than, than me. Well, I, I would agree. And I would say I think one one power that narratives have is that instead of telling it, you see it happen. And so there's already a validation within the narrative itself. And so if I see it happen, and it already validates that it's happening, what are the general themes that would allow that specific to happen? So I think that's one addition. I think another point, and Michael, I think you mentioned this in your talk, one of the things that's a little bit unsettling about it is that um, people will generalize from narratives even when they're not typical. So you get this vivid case, and even if it's, say, a bad reaction to a drug that happens one in a million times, that still seems to hold undue sway in our minds, or it can. So That's an important point. All right, we have a question down here. And remember, if you're in the audience and you have a question, we have two mic runners down the aisle. So raise your hand high and get their attention. I'm Stephen Rose from Carnegie Mellon University. I'm curious if information that gets presented as narratives gets transmitted more faithfully than, say, statistical evidence. I mean, does it get repeated more faithfully to subsequent audiences? I'm, I'm thinking, I don't, I don't know, the, it'd be nice if I could cite a study. Um, but um, certainly, consistent with all of our um, research on, on memory, you know, when you create uh, you communicate with a narrative and you create this sort of general understanding of the phenomenon, um, that general understanding, the way the person then communicates it, maybe at a time much later, um, they may get a lot of the details wrong, but if they have that general understanding, that's likely to persist. Whereas if you um, have something that's sort of more um, just a list of verbatim facts, you know, those facts like, oh, I heard it was one in 20 people, such and such. Like, no, I think it was one in 20,000. Well, some, you know, somewhere like, that's, I think, more likely to get lost. And I think one other thing, so the, the narrative itself, as I said, you know, is a unit that can transfer, but you can tell a narrative many different ways. So within a narrative, there is a causal chain, a cause and effect linkage that basically is the essence of the story. So there's description that goes around um, surrounding that chain, the description can be pulled out, put in, et cetera, but that causal chain 
I think, is the unit that does get transferred. And there's evidence to show that information that's placed on that chain is actually more influential than the same information placed elsewhere in the narrative that does not have a cause and effect relationship. I'm excited about this question. The tweeter actually said, can't wait to hear the answer to this question, and neither can I. Um, do you feel like narrative can help comprehension of science that's beyond the human scale? So when we're talking about very, very small things, very, very large things, things that we didn't really evolve to comprehend. Yes, so thank you, Twitterverse, for letting me answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> so this is something I'm very interested in, because I think, you know, as humans, we experience a very thin ribbon of reality that's constrained by our biological perceptual systems. And so, so for instance, I can experience, I just experienced 16 minutes, um, I can experience a year, if I'm lucky, I'll experience 100 years, I will never be able to experience 1,000 years, or 10,000 years, or, or however long it takes for a plastic bottle to <laughs> disintegrate. We can go the other way, a nanosecond, I can never experience it. Oh, I just missed it, so. <laughs> so I think within, human scale, and it's not just time, you can pick almost any dimension, that there is a scale that which humans are very adept at understanding. So I think within human scale, we're pretty good at making decisions and understanding the world. The problem is that science very often leaves that bubble, it goes outside of human scale. And so I think climate change is a perfect example. So we're supposed to understand what's gonna happen in 100 years, 1,000 years, 10,000 years, at these huge global scales Chances are my perception of that is going to be way off from reality, yet I'm expected to make a decision that affects policy today about that. So these biases like they're going to be very far off. And I think that narrative is basically a format of taking phenomena and packaging it into human scale because you're looking at events through human eyes. And so I think that narratives may intrinsically help help take that that's outside of human scale and move it into the bubble. I have a little bit of uh, preliminary data that I think is interesting. And so for objects that are larger than human scale, I had um, sliders. So I had a silhouette of a human and a silhouette of many different objects. And I said, okay, ready? Don't think about it too hard, but they're on sliders. So quickly make one bigger, make one smaller until they're about the relative proportion between them and then quickly move on to the next one. Objects that were bigger than humans, every single one, people had a bias to make them smaller, to get them closer to human scale. I don't know how big a uh, speed limit sign is, but it's shorter than, I think it's shorter than it actually is. Small objects actually went the other way. So small objects, I stretch up a little bit to make them closer to human scale. So I think that's, that's promising, and the next step is to get narrative in there. All right, we've got a question here in the back. Hey, Aaron Hurtis, Union of Concerned Scientists. Uh, one of the issues that scientists I work with tend to have is that their substantive work with their colleagues and their discussion with their colleagues, it's usually about reducing uncertainty at the edges of knowledge. And for public communication tasks, scientists are often trying to reinforce pretty basic knowledge or pretty basic understanding. Uh, so I often find that when scientists are asked to tell stories about their work, uh, they're sort of off in a place where they're not connecting with the public on some of those basics they're trying to reinforce. And I'm wondering if there's some practical tips from your study of narrative that can help scientists bridge some of those gaps, um, especially in their discussions with the, med with the media, which often focuses on a lot of that very new research um, and sometimes skips over a lot of those basics that scientists are still struggling to reinforce. I think a, a good example is the private universe study, which asks, um, so it, they actually put a narrative ar around uh, why is it hotter in New York in July than it is in January. And the story that people bring, the narrative that they have is that the Earth is closer to the sun in July, whereas in fact it's actually closer to the sun in January. And what they've done is build a a narrative around why this might or might not be the, the case, and you have to decompose the narrative that people carry with them, uh, which is the diagrams that, that they've seen in textbooks. So you can do that with basic scientific uh, concepts, and the key thing that happens that the private universe talks about is that scientists usually assume that people know the basic facts or the basic things 
Whereas it turns out they have a beautiful video of a Harvard graduation where they ask people the same question. And there's, uh, they give you the most crazy answers. And these are people getting PhDs from Harvard. And uh, their answers are just like the kids in Brookline who are uh, answering the same question. So, but they've never been asked, do they really know it or not? Well, and so, I th uh, oh, can I just no, jump in real quick? Course. I think that might be an area where journalists or people who are helping to translate the science can help by sort of reminding the scientists or pointing out that that, that, that knowledge might not be there. And a, another kind of rule of thumb is sometimes the, what, what's called the grandmother rule, like explain this like you were explaining it to your grandmother or somebody else who's smart but doesn't know science necessarily. And I think one other media connection so along with that list I, I, I put on the screen, there's also news values that, that journalists use to try and figure out what within the story will be of interest. And one of those is impact. And so a lot of times um, a journalist may ask, what impact does this have for the reader? So if the science has impact, of course, go ahead and share it. But sometimes I fear when the science really does not have an impact, the scientist may be may feel that, that they have to stretch it to say, okay, this is what this may do for the public well off in the future. And I think that's a possible pitfall. So if you have impact, use it. If not, don't stretch it too far and kind of give up the, the credibility of what you're trying to say. We have a brief question from the gentleman who's standing. Uh, Rob Pennock from Michigan State University. So I recommend using narrative as well, but there's a bit of a worry that I always have in recommending that, uh, which is, uh, the worry that comes from the, the debate not so long ago, the science wars, uh, where the whole critique of science was based upon science just being another narrative, and so really not privileged in any way to speak about certain types of things. It's just another story. Uh, I have my own students who will describe a science book as a novel. Um, and so the challenge that I, I wonder that we face when we're telling our stories of science is how to do it in such a way so that we're making use of the power of story, but still recognizing the difference between fiction and nonfiction. Do you have any advice about that? Well, if I could, the first point I think is if you think you can, in the public's mind, distinguish science from other narratives, I would sadly say dream on. I mean, the nature of the postmodern world is that it is a big souk out there, and everything in principle is a different booth that people can come to or not. That's unfortunate, but I think that's the reality. I think science's best uh, attempt to counter that is to do something that Kathleen Hall Jameson said this morning, which is to focus on the way in which it does things, that a scientific story is falsifiable, that there can be evidence which will make the theory have to get revised, whereas fictional narratives are endlessly pliant, and the people who believe in those narratives are, in effect, uh, believers in something indistinguishable uh, in some ways, I'll get in trouble for this, uh, from a cult or from a religion. They are closed universes in which no evidence is able to force a change in the paradigm. So I think an effort to explain the nature of scientific epistemology is at least a rear guard action to, if not privilege science, at least distinguish it. And I think to piggyback um, uh, some of those sentiments, there's a question coming in from the web here that I think is an important one. It says, science is messy. We've talked about this, I've heard this repeated in day one and day two, false starts, um, uh, dead ends. It, and it's a process, it's a messy process, but the way that science is taught in schools is often neat and tidy facts. So does this cause a disconnect when our, with our audiences when we try to use narrative? But it may, it may set people up if they've come to learn science as this very clean sort of uh, experience and then you get things from the news and you find out one day that uh, you know, Oat Bran is going to save your life, and the next day, Oat Bran is a silent killer, or so, you know, whatever it is, and, and people sort of don't um, know what to do with all this conflicting information, because they, they have learned it so, it's such a tidy little package. 
And so what do we do about that? I mean, what do we, you well, know, we can change how we teach science, right? I mean, we can change. I think, I think the answer to a lot of the questions, I think, throughout this whole symposium has been, we are not preparing our children to understand science very well. Right. And if we can sort of start from the beginning with an understanding of what science is, what makes science different, and in some of these experiences, like you were talking about with the undergraduates, but start even earlier um, to get kids to understand how science works, why sometimes there's uh, conflicting information, why things come out the way they do, then you can prepare the whole population to understand things as they come out. And I think right now, we're not doing a great job of that. And my focus, you know, in, in my work is on the adult population. It's on the voting public, right? These are people who, if they didn't learn the scientific method, well, they missed their chance because they're probably not going back to school. So how can we, as science communicators, affect change amongst that population? One thing I wanted to say is the National Academy brought out a, a wonderful uh, book on science education in the high school lab. And they have one section in the book about how experiments really work and that they are really messy. And uh, it's, a, it's a really nice summary of, because in the science labs, you're supposed to get result X uh, if you do this experiment, but they end up getting result Y. And so I actually asked my classes, what do you do? Do you fudge your data, which people do in, in high school sometimes? So the, um, and that expectation that it's always going to turn out in exactly the same way is, I think, a key thing that the National Academy uh, really put forward in the nation's lab report. So it's worth reading. And I think I would add that the messiness actually is good fodder for stories. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, I want to thank the panelists and the discussants for joining us today. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs>